Okay, so um, my name's Tim Miller. I work at Plant and Food Research in New Zealand. Um, this work was also part of my PhD project through Otago University, which I submitted late last year. Um, and it's also been partially funded by the Tools for Polyploids um, project. So thanks for that. Um, so I'm just going to go over sort of a quick recap um, and description of what MC Hat does. Um, this talk is really intended to present the updates because I did give a presentation on this software last year as well. However, I'm, I realize that the majority of people in the audience probably have never used the tool before or even read about it. So I'll try and do both in this talk, both um, give a brief introduction to the tool and give the updates of the newer features. Um, then uh, the majority of this talk is going to be an example um, notebook, which I'll work through, which is available online. Um, it's probably a bit much for people to follow along with in this um, the, the uh, allotted time slot, so I'll just work through it by myself and it'll be available for others to look at afterwards. Um, and then a quick summary and look at what sort of future areas we're interested in. So to recap, MCHAP is a tool for micro haplotype assembly. Um, Everywhere you see micro haplotype in this um, presentation, you can also just think of it as local haplotypes as they're all in, um, described earlier on. It's essentially the same idea, just slightly different terminology used. Um, a bit of a difference between this tool and his tool is this tool is designed specifically for assembling micro haplotypes from sequencing data rather than from a SNP array. So MCHAP is really um, two separate tools. Um, there's MCHAP assembly, uh, assemble, which is used for de novo assembly, and then there's MCHAP call, which is used for recalling genotypes from a known set of haplotypes. And the two of them play together quite nicely, and we'll have a look at that in the example shortly. Um, the tool itself uses Markov Chang and Monte Carlo simulation. Um, so this is a reasonably computationally intensive way of doing haplotype assembly, but it does have some nice properties and it, it gives us a lot of metadata about the quality of a genotype call. Um, and finally, a real focus of MCHAP is to be uh, to try and use bioinformatic formats as much as possible. So the tool is available online under the MIT license, so it's very freely available for any use. Um, and the link there is to our plant and food GitHub repository. So this is the kind of data that I'm working on mostly. This is um, capture GBS data from rapid genomics. And this is what uh, our line sequences look like over a single um, bait target. So each of those gray lines is a MGS read, which has been aligned to a re reference genome. And then those colored dots indicate um, single nucleotide variants with respect to that reference genome. If we zoom in a bit on this, what you see is that these variants have linkage between them. So um, you see these different patterns of variants along these reads, and those are indicative of the underlying haplotypes present in that organism. So the idea of MCHAP and other tools like it is to try and exploit this linkage between variants and use that to assemble longer variants than we would normally get from um, variant calling. Um, but you'll also notice in here there's some reads that look like they have um, variants that aren't found in any of the other reads. And that's the kind of, so there is some low level of sequencing error in these NGS reads, which needs to be accounted for. Um, so as I said before, MCHAP uses a Michael Chain Monte Carlo approach to do this. In very simple terms, what this is doing is it's taking our aligned read fragments, which you see on the left-hand side of this diagram. It's putting them into this simulation program, which iteratively generates a chain of genotypes, which you see on the right-hand side. And this program is designed to do this in a way that the proportion of a, um, the proportion of a genotype within that output chain is proportional to the posterior probability of that genotype. So a Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation starts with an initial genotype. This is for a single sample. Um, that initial genotype can be a just completely random or it can be an informed guess, which is what we do in MC Hat, um, which can speed things up a little bit. Each step in the Markov chain involves proposing a new genotype based on the current genotype. Um, the proposed genotype is either accepted or rejected based on the combination of the prior distribution and a likelihood function. So the likelihood function is where we include that read data, our observations. The prior distribution can incorporate information that we already know about that sample. And this can be things like the inbreeding coefficient of that sample, 
or the um, population allele frequencies for the population that that sample comes from. As I said before, the proportion of steps in which the chain spins in a given genotype is an estimate of the posterior probability of that genotype. And the posterior mode genotype, which Jeff Endelman talked a bit about yesterday, is the genotype with the highest estimated posterior probability, i.e. the most frequent genotype within the chain. And that's the genotype that MC HAP for by default report is the genotype call in the output VCF file. So just to look at this diagram again, on the right hand side, you can see each one of those lines indicates a genotype. So this is um, showing a tetraploid individual and you can see four short lines, sorry, each step here is a long line and then that contains four um, haplotypes. And so if you look down that chain of haplot uh, genotypes on the right hand side, the most frequent genotype within that chain would be called as the um, genotype call in the output VCF file. So that's a very brief flyby um, introduction to MC HAP. In terms of updates since I last gave a presentation, so last year we had just released version 0.5.1, went out to 0.8.0. Um, the main three sort of areas I'll look at today is an option to report posterior allele frequencies. Um, so this is not the mode genotype, this is equivalent to the posterior mean genotype. Um, we'll also talk about including prior allele uh, prior on allele frequencies and the MC HAP call tool specifically. And we'll um, go over this idea of a pooled haplotype assembly, which can be useful in some situations like a biparental cross. There's a number of other changes in there as well, mostly around trying to simplify things and have more sensible default parameters and speeding things up. Finally, there's I've written quite a bit of documentation for the tool in the last few months, including the notebook I'm about to present. So if any of you answered the survey questions for MC HAP when you signed up for this conference, you probably would have ticked that MC HAP had pretty terrible documentation. Things have improved a lot in the last few months, so hopefully next time you look, it'll be a lot better. Um, so I'll switch to the example next. So this is based on real data. This is a published data set or a, a very small subset of a published data set. And in this um, example, we'll work through de novo assembly using MC HAP assemble. Um, looking at some of the options with that, and then we'll look at recalling genotypes using MC HAP call, which I refer to as the two-step approach, um, and some of the other additional features like doing a pooled assembly. So, cool. Can you see this Jupyter notebook here now? I'm just going to assume you can. Yes. Yes, yes we can see it. Cool. Great. Um, so this notebook is available online and I'll, I've forgotten to put the link in the chat, but I'll do that after this talk. So this is a bash notebook. So all of the code that you see run in this notebook is um, bash code. So you can run it in a Jupyter notebook with the bash kernel, or you could just run it in a Unix like um, terminal shell. So the input files for MC HAP assemble are a BAM file um, containing sequence data for each of your samples or one, one BAM file per sample. Um, so that's the binary alignment format. We also require a bed file, which specifies target loci. So these are effectively specifying the haplotype blocks or haplo blocks that Roland talked about before. Um, we have an input VCF file. This VCF file is used for specifying our basis SNPs, which we use to assemble our haplotypes. And we also require a reference genome. So if we look through this input data, we can see in the BAM file subdirectory, we have one BAM file per each of our samples. So in this very small data set, we're looking at two parental samples and then uh, 20 progeny coming from those parents. So a very simple biparental cross. Um, the bed file, if you're familiar with bed file, it's just a simple four column bed file. So the first three columns in that file indicate the genomic locus or the haploblock that you want to assemble. And then the fourth column, which is optional, indicates a ID for that location. So that fourth column is optional, although it's very useful because that ID will be output in the output VCF file, which means that you can link up your inputs and your outputs more easily. Um, in this case, we're just looking at four low size, so just a smaller bed file. Now the input VCF file, um, this is actually a very simple VCF file. So 
the first thing you might notice is that there's no sample data in here at all. For this input VCF file, MCHAP doesn't make use of any sample data. So if it is present, it will be completely ignored. All it's using this file for is the locations of your single nucleotide variants and the reference on alternate alleles for those variants. Um, these need to be single nucleotide variants. However, they can be multi-allelic. So further down in this VCF, we do have some triallelic SNPs as well. And this VCF can be produced by any sort of variant caller that you will um, want to use. If you do have um, more complex variants like indels in there, they will just be ignored. Um, so it's only going to pull out the SNPs from that VCF file. Now, running a basic assembly program will look something like this. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not actually going to run this now. It, it takes less than a minute, I think, this example, but um, I've already run them in advance just to be sure. So the first four arguments to MCHAP are those input files we talked about, your BAM files, um, your bed file containing targets, your VCF of basis SNPs, and your reference genome. And now the next two arguments are optional, so the ploidy and the inbreeding. Um, the ploidy is fairly self-explanatory. This is the ploidy of your organisms. Um, by default, MCHAP will assume everything is diploid, but you can specify any ploidy, including odd-numbered ploidies. And in addition, if you are working in a mixed ploidy data set, you can instead specify a file that um, contains the ploidy of each sample individually. So MCHAP can work with mixed ploidy data sets. The inbreeding coefficient here is a little less obvious why we're using that. Um, the inbreeding coefficient is very helpful information to have in that prior distribution. So by default, MZHAP will assume everything has an inbreeding coefficient of zero, which is kind of the most logical default to use. However, that's actually reasonably unrealistic for most breeding programs and particularly for autopolyploids um, because you have all sorts of effects like double reduction that it can increase the inbreeding coefficient. In this case, I'm just taking a guess at the inbreeding coefficient for every sample. But again, if you have specific coefficients for each of your samples, you can include those into a file and um, tell MCHAP to use uh, per sample inbreeding coefficients as well. Um, the reason that the inbreeding coefficient is important in simple terms is that it tells you about the expected homozygosity of a sample. So the higher the inbreeding coefficient, the more homozygous that sample is likely to be. Um, and it will have a play a greater role in the assembly process if you have low read depths. So if you're trying to assemble genotypes, you have low read depths and your the output seems to be excessively heterozygous, then you should really consider um, whether you've got a realistic estimate of the inbreeding coefficient. And generally speaking, it's probably better to slightly overestimate the inbreeding coefficient than to underestimate it. Um, the final two lines here are not actually part of MCHAP. So for those unfamiliar with um, sort of bash scripting, what we're doing here is MCHAP prints out a plain text VCF file. We're then piping that into the BGZIP utility, which is available as part of HTSLib, which compresses the VCF file. And then we're using the Tabix program from that same library to index that VCF file for fast rapid access later on. So if we take a quick look at the header data from the output of MCHAP assemble, I won't go through all of this, but I just want to draw your attention to the top here where we store a lot of metadata around how the VCF was produced. So we store the date it was produced, the version of MCHAP, and the exact command that was used to create the VCF, as well as the random seed that was used for that VCF file or for the mark of chains. So this is just to point out that there is a lot of information stored in the VCF itself about how it was produced. And then we have um, our various metadata fields with short descriptions of what they contain. If we take a look at the first assembly locus or the first Hapler block in the output VCF, this is the kind of output we get from MCHAP. So this is a standard VCF record, except you'll see that we have these much longer um, alleles for our variant. Um, instead of just SNPs. So each of these, these are our micro haplotypes. Um, these are 120 base pairs long because that's what was specified in the bed file. And we can see our reference allele is what I've just highlighted here. And in this case, we have three alternate alleles that are separated by commas. So this particular locus, locus looks like it's assembled quite well. Um, I say that 
primarily because we don't have a huge number of haplotypes here, which is usually a good sign. And if we look at our two parent genotypes, which are the first two genotypes um, in, this, in, in the sample order, um, we can see that they contain all of the alleles that are found in the progeny. So that's a reassuring sign. And if we look through those progeny genotypes, they look like sensible um, combinations of the parental genotypes. Now, there are a couple of interesting things to note. One is that we have three alternate alleles reported up here um, in terms of the actual alleles, but that third alternate allele hasn't been called in any of the genotypes. And the reason for that is because MCHAP um, likes to record information about the full posterior distribution, or at least um, the majority of the posterior distribution. So it's going to report alleles that have a reasonable posterior probability of occurring in any of the um, samples. So in this case, it's reported the third alternate allele because there is some probability that ha it has occurred in at least one of at the that it is present in at least one of the samples. However, the actual posterior mode genotypes for any of the samples don't include that haplotype. So you will end up with what we refer to as zero count alleles in your VCF file. The other thing I'll draw your attention to here is the second parent. So we have what looks like a very sensible genotype call for it. However, if we look at the GQ score for this individual, it's only three, which corresponds to a posterior probability of 0.48. So it's a sensible looking genotype call, but it's actually got quite weak support. And what we'll look um, into is how we can improve the confidence around that genotype call. Um, to give an idea of what a poorly assembled locus looks like, this is locus 12, and we can see Right off the bat, we have a much larger number of haplotypes being reported. Some of these are zero count haplotypes, so they can kind of be ignored, but we can see that we still have more haplotypes called than we should have in a biparental tetraploid cross. And if we look through these genotype calls, what we'll see is that some of those progeny contain alleles that haven't been found in the parents. So MCHAP isn't actually aware of the structure of the population. It's calling all of these samples individually. So you can have genotype call, uh, allele calls that don't make sense like this. Um, there's, a not, there's a few more signs that this is a poorly assembled locus. Um, one of them is that we have some partial genotypes. So where one of the alleles is replaced with a dot. That's because the posterior mode genotype for this individual is so weakly supported that that third allele there, uh, sorry, the fourth allele there didn't meet the threshold to actually be reported in the VCF. So with the MCHAP assemble, you can get these partial genotypes when you have um, a poor quality assembly. That's not a problem with MCHAP call, and we'll look at that later. Finally, one of the really important bits of metadata here is this MCI tag, which stands for Markov chain incongruence. So for each sample, we run two replicate Markov chains um, to do the genotype inference, and then we compare the results of those Markov chains. If they seem to both support the same genotype, their MCI field will be zero, which is good. That's what you want. If they report different genotypes, then that value will be a one or a two. Um, the, if they support different genotypes and the combination of those two genotypes contains more alleles than you should find in an individual of that ploidy, so you have too many alleles um, in that genotype, that's um, the MCI tag will be a two like this sample here. And what that's saying is um, it, it's kind of an indicator that that could be some sort of putative copy number variation or something going on at this locus. Now, if you had just one sample with a value of one or two, it wouldn't be too much of a concern. But in this case, we have multiple samples that have a value of two here. So that's saying that there's something suspicious going on at this locus. It could be some sort of copy number variation. It could be poorly aligned reads, um, or it could be that we've underestimated the ploidy of the samples at that locus. But whatever it, whatever it is, it's telling us that there's an indication that there are more haplotypes present at that locus than there should be. And so that's why it's an important field to understand. When you do have a um, this sort of value of two in here, a lot of these posterior probabilities can no longer be trusted because it's essentially saying that the assumptions of the model we're using have been violated. So that's why it's such an important value to check.
Um, and finally, to give you an idea of what happens if you have very low read depth or zero read depth relative to your ploidy, um, you'll get an output that looks like this, so a whole bunch of null genotypes. Now, I do want to point out that this is not a case of MC Hap saying there's no data here, so I won't trial and assemble, uh, try and assemble the locus. It has still run the full assembly, but it's effectively sampling directly from the prior distribution with no additional information which means we have this very weak result. And you can see most of these samples have a posterior probability of around 0.002. So that's rounded to two dec uh, three decimal places. And so what's happened here is it has actually produced genotype calls, but they're essentially random and very poorly supported. So MCHAP has filtered out all of the alleles relating to those genotype calls, which is why you end up with those null genotypes. Um, and in this case, that includes the reference allele. So the VCF spe specification requires that we always re report the reference allele. When you're dealing with highly multi-allelic haplotypes like this, it's actually quite common for you to have a locus where the reference allele hasn't been found. And to make that clear, we've introduced this ref mask tag. So if you see this in your in a locus for your uh, in your VCF file, what that means is the reference allele has only been reported because it's required by the VCF format. It hasn't actually been found with any confidence in any of your samples. Okay, how are we going for time? We'll see if we can get through all of this. Um, so reporting posterior allele frequencies, this is something I talked about as a new feature of MC Hat. Um, so this is the exact same command that was shown before, except now we're including this report AFP, which tells MCHAP that we want to report those posterior allele frequencies. This has been left as an optional field because it can be quite large and make for a large VCF file. But if we run that um, assembly again and then look at locus number one, you should have the exact same result as we had before. However, now each of the samples will have this um, additional field at the end of their um, format column, which reports the posterior allele frequencies for that sample. So in a case like this individual where you have um, a very well supported genotype call 0001, those posterior allele frequencies will essentially be the dosage divided by the ploidy. Um, so very intuitive. For a sample like this one here where it hasn't been as well supported, what we'll have is um, values that approximate the reported dosage or probably approximate the reported dosage, but it's giving you a mean, it's effectively a posterior mean genotype, so it is like a continuous genotype. You can have values that don't match the dosage exactly. And that's the advantage of it. Um, Jeff Endelman gave a really nice talk yesterday about some of the advantages of working with posterior mean genotypes. Um, one final thing here is that we also report the population mean of these allele frequencies in the info field. So this can be thought of as the population mean allele, fre um, population allele frequencies or an estimate of the population allele frequencies. And we'll use that later on. Um, this is this, the problematic locus we were looking at before. And this is, I've just put this in here to show that when you have a lot of haplotypes, because we're reporting one value per sample per haplotype, this can quickly make for a very large VCF. So you probably only want to use this if you actually intend on use, um, only actually want to include this in the output VCF if you actually intend on using it. Um, one more important parameter to talk about to talk about is this haplotype posterior threshold argument. I don't we have a fairly sensible default for this, so I don't think you'll often need to use it, but it is um, something to be aware of. So I talked before about how in MCHAP, a haplotype is only reported if it has reasonable confidence of occurring in one or more samples. By default, that's a um, that threshold is a posterior probability of 0.2 or higher that it occurs in at least one sample you can adjust that threshold using this argument. And so that can be any value between zero and one. Um, you probably, however, never actually want to have it as zero or one. So if you have that value as one, what will likely happen is you'll end up with a whole lot of partial genotype calls because many of the even quite relevant haplotypes will be excluded from the output VCF. As you have it as a, if you have it as a value of zero, um, here, what will happen is 
every single haplotype encountered by any Markov chain will be reported. And that can make for an absolutely massive VCF file. So if we run this command, which otherwise was the same as before, and then look at the first locus, remember this is the one that assembled nice and cleanly, um, we get this absolutely enormous number of haplotypes reported. And most of that is absolutely noise. The vast majority of those are completely uninformative. Um, what you can see here with a sample that has um, assembled fairly poorly, so this is the second parent with a posterior probability of 0.48 for the mode, is a lot of these haplotypes have a very low probability of occurring in that sample. And that probably means that they've just been encountered once or twice in a Markov chain. So this is why we don't report every haplotype encountered by default, but by having a threshold value and excluding some of the haplotypes, it's worth noting that that does mean the posterior distributions that MCHAP reports can be slightly truncated. So if you have a sample with posterior allele frequencies and you take the sum of those allele frequencies, they should sum to one because they're frequencies. However, if they sum to less than one, that indicates that that posterior distribution for that sample has been truncated. And in that case, it's probably you probably don't want the full posterior distribution because it will be so diffuse um, and so noisy. So in that case, what I'd recommend is you actually just normalize those values so that they do sum to one. But it just it, it lets you know that you're working with um, it lets you know that you're working with a truncated uh, posterior distribution. So we'll move on to MC Hat Core now. Um, and what I call the two-step approach. So MCHAP call is similar to MCHAP assemble, except rather than inputting a, a reference genome and a VCF of basis SNPs, instead we input a VCF containing known haplotypes. So in this case, we're using the output of MCHAP assemble as the input for MCHAP call, which is why I refer to it as the two-step approach. Um, the other arguments of this command are essentially the same, um, at least all of the common arguments are. And so we've just run a very simple recalling process here. If we look at locus one again, we'll get very similar results to the initial assembly because the results for locus one and the initial assembly were already quite good. Um, there are, however, a couple of differences. So if we look at that second parent that had a poorly supported call before, we can see that it the posterior support for that genotype call has moved from 0.4 something up to 0.8 something. So that's quite an improvement. Um, and that's because by specifying a subset of known haplotypes to use, we're essentially constraining that prior distribution down to a much smaller set of haplotypes. So in MCHAP call, that prior distribution essentially um, is a flat prior over all possible haplotypes. Uh, sorry, in MCHAP assemble, it's a flat prior over all possible haplotypes. In MCHAP call, it's a flat prior over the um, known haplotypes that were input. One negative, um, well, not so much negative, but one difference between the genotype calls in this um, VCF file as opposed to the one that came out of MCHAP assemble is one of our samples, Progeny 7, which is somewhere in here, has now been called with that third alternate allele, that one that we said was probably a noise allele, but has some level of evidence of being found in one of these samples. Um, and this is a, a bit of a problem because that allele hasn't been found in either of the parents and none of the other progeny, so it seems unrealistic. Um, but if we look at the posterior support for that genotype call, it's about 0.5, so about a 50% probability. And previously when we, um, assembled this sample, it had a genotype call that looked more sensible of 0012. However, that also had a posterior probability of about 0.5. So what this is suggesting is that this genotype could kind of go either way. When looked at just by itself without um, any sort of context from the population as a whole, it could have either of these genotypes and MCHAP can't really discern it. If you run this with a different random seed, you might get the other genotype. So what this tells us is that this is the kind of individual individual that could be improved quite substantially by including more information in the prior distribution, which is what we'll look at next. So in MCHAP call, we can specify 
prior allele frequencies. So I said before that by default, this is treated as a flat prior where all of the known haplotypes are treated as equally common in the population. However, we can specify um, some value in the input VCF file to use as those prior allele frequencies. Um, we do that with these two commands here. I do plan in future to simplify this down to a single command. Um, but essentially we're saying that this is the field we want to use. So we're saying we want to use the posterior allele frequencies for the population that were found by MCHAP assemble as the prior allele frequencies in um, MCHAP call. And essentially what this is doing is we're using that initial assembly to generate, so we're actually ignoring all of the individual genotype calls in that initial assembly, but we're just taking the population information. And so we're using MCHAP assemble to generate a more realistic population prior for all of our samples and then recalling the genotypes with MCHAP call based on that prior. So if we look at LOCUS1 again, now we have very similar um, genotype calls to the original assembly. But if we look at that second parent, for example, that posterior support for that um, genotype call has now improved from around 0.5 up to 0.99. So we now have what looks like a very high confidence call. And likewise, the progeny that um, was sort of 50-50 or whether it had that new allele or not, um, it has been recalled with alleles that are found in the parents and the posterior probability for that genotype call is now up to 0.97, so much higher than 0.5, which we saw before. So in effect, we're using the population information generated by MCHAP assemble to inform our recalling with MCHAP call. So we're generating a population prior and then applying that to our individuals. And in this way, we're taking information, this, this is essentially using the information present in related samples to, to improve the assembly of any given sample. And so this approach works for arbitrary population structure to an extent. If you think of this as a natural population or something like a biparental cross, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so it, it can work in effectively natural populations and it is most powerful when you have a large population of highly related individuals, which is what we often deal with in breeding programs. Now, finally, I'll quickly go through this two-step approach because I'm aware I'm running out of time. Um, so well, I've just demonstrated the two-step approach. Now, if we're working with a biparental population as we are in this example, we can take that even a step further using a pooled assembly. So if you think about a biparental population of tetraploids, there should be at most eight haplotypes present in that population in theory. Um, and if it's an unselected population, we would expect the population allele frequencies to be approximately proportional to the um, allele dosages in the combined parents. And so by making this assumption, we can pull all of the read data from all of our samples into one pseudo sample, which we assemble as an octoploid. So this is essentially pulling all of the data from our individual samples and assuming that um, treating that as a single octoploid sample, which represents our population. So to do this, we use the sample pool command um, that just requires a name for that pseudo sample in the output VCF file. And now we're specifying that it has a ploidy of eight instead of four. So if we run this and look at that first locus, we can see that we have our pseudo octoploid genotype call here. Um, so just a single sample in this VCF. And we have similar haplotypes before, except now we only have two alternate alleles instead of three alternate alleles. So we can already see that this has squashed down our prior distribution a bit by squashing out that third alternate allele. To complete the two-step approach, we then run MCHAP call um, and specifying to use the allele frequencies from that pooled assembly as the population allele frequencies in our prior. And if we look at the result of that, um, we have again similar results to before because um, for locus one, we already had a good assembly in the first place, except we can see that the posterior probability or the estimated posterior probability for that second parent has now improved to one. Um, and in fact, most of our genotype calls in that here now have a posterior probability of one based on that pooled assembly. Um, if we look at a different locus, so this is one we haven't looked at before, locus 16. This is a 
locus that assembled reasonably well in the first place. So here we're looking at the original pooled, um, uh, uh, the original two-step approach, not the pooled version. Um, and we have got a fairly good result here, except we do see um, that there are some of the progeny genotype calls have alleles that aren't present in either of the parents. And so by doing a pooled assembly, we can improve this. Um, so if we look at the results from the pooled two-step approach, again, similar, but we have fewer haplotype calls and the allele calls present in all of our progeny seem to match the parents now. So somewhere in there, um, there was a genotype that was initially called as 3456, which has now been called as 2345, which are all alleles found in the parents. So it's still not a perfectly assemb perfect assembly at this locus, but it has improved with the um, using the pooled assembly approach. And finally, just to go back to that problematic locus, um, so this is looking at the original results of this. And now if we look at the pooled assembly approach, we can see that the result is a little cleaner, except we still have allele calls present in our progeny um, genotypes, which aren't present in our parents. So that's still indicating that something funny is going on there. And that's actually a good thing, because if there is genuinely some sort of copy number variation at that um, locus, we don't want to have a prior so strong that we force all of the genotypes to make sense even when they shouldn't. So we do actually want, if there is real evidence of incongruence in the data, we do actually want that to be reported in some form in our output. So that's a real flyby of MC hat. Um, I'll just finish the presentation quickly. So um, just a quick summary of the features. MC hat works on any ploides. This can be odd number ploides as well, and it works on mixed ploidy data sets. Um, we can specify priors using the combination of inbreeding coefficients and allele um, prior allele frequencies. We can report posterior allele frequencies, which are effectively posterior mean genotypes in addition to the posterior mode genotypes. MC hat can actually report the full posterior distribution of genotypes for each sample, but that creates massive VCF files and can be hard to work with. Um, and finally, we've worked on this two-step approach, which is really useful in populations of related individuals where we essentially generate a population prior and then apply that prior to all of the individuals. Um, MCHAP has reasonably good performance, so it's using an MCMC, which is computationally intensive, but we've taken a lot of care to write the more um, core parts of that using um, a special compiler for a subset of Python, which makes the code faster. And there are options for running this in parallel. So I think the largest assembly I've done was around 800 samples across 10,000 loci, and we were able to distribute that across the, our computational cluster using, I think it was about 500 cores or something like that. And MC hat makes, where possible, MC hat makes as much use of um, standard bioinformatic formats as it can. Um, this is a slide from last year's talk. So these were the sort of four things I'd outlined that needed, that I wanted to work on. Um, documentation, the use of prior and posterior allele frequencies. And I had this sort of stretch goal of incorporating pedigree data. So the first three of those I've ticked off now. Um, I have made quite a bit of progress on incorporating pedigree data into the program. Um, I had hoped several months ago, I thought I was gonna have something ready in time to report today, but of course these things are always slightly more difficult than you imagine. Um, but I do hope to have some update in the future where we have are able to incorporate pedig pedigree data into the program to again and further inform um, the prior distribution. So thanks Tools for Polyploid for um, some of the funding and the time to work on this and the opportunity to present. Um, also, I'd like to say thank you to the CRIP program, which is a PFR internal funding for research related to kiwifruit, which um, paid for part of my PhD.